Welcome to finite element methods. Today we'll be discussing the 1D finite element method as a parametric formulation. And what are the finite element steps that we are trying to use to develop a systematic way of solving governing equations over compl complicated domain? And the first approach we want to use is to derive the partial differential equation of the, of the physics of the problem either derive or determine what the governing equation is that describes the physics of the problem. And then we want to formulate the general element behavior. And to do that, we derive the weak form of the partial differential equation or the ordinary differential equation. We will then use an approximate solution over that domain, which I'm calling element. And we'll then determine the element stiffness matrix and force vector for that particular element. We'll then discretize the domain of the structure into small elements. We'll assemble the stiffness matrix and force vectors. Then we impose the boundary conditions, solve the algebraic system of equations, and then we can post process the results to understand uh, what the results are telling us about the physics of that problem. The governing equation for the actual bar that was discussed previously was EAU prime prime plus p equals zero and that v does not go there and this particular domain which is an element here shown has a dis distributed load p and has a load pi at node i uh, load pj at node a, j and here i'm showing a middle uh, node so it has an interior node in this example which makes it a quadratic element element in this case but the governing question is this one uh, you also have uh, that we derived that previously. Um, here U is a deflection, the actual deflection of this um, actual bar, and E is a modulus and A is a cross section. And to basically forge ahead, what we learn is that we have to multiply uh, this residual times B, and then integrate that residual over the domain. The domain here is the single element we're looking at. And what we've done is, we've made the residual orthogonal to V integrated by parts once to reduce the continuity requirements from strong form to weak form. And that in that way, reduce the continuity requirements for the approximation function, but also it allows you to satisfy just essential boundary conditions of the problem. And the weak form of the problem was derived as this equation here. And I won't rederive re re that since we've done it a few times now. Um, but bottom line, this is what we found for the weak form. We also found that to formulate as, uh, the weak form for a single element, we just plug in the deflection U, which has been approximated over the domain. And the domain um, for that approximation here is quadratic. And we chosen shape functions as the trial or basis functions which when multiplied by this column vector gives you that approximation function. And recall that these shape functions can be found in a very systematic way. We, we know how to do it for quadratic elements and there's a quick way to find them. We also know that these shape functions satisfy the partition unity, uh, meaning that the addition of these shape functions over the domain provide you with provide you with, uh, if you add the shape functions, you get one. If you value the shape function at node k and node j, you get one, zero, but you will get one at the node of interest. And the same thing for j and the same thing for k. So the approximation function has been simplified quite a bit, um, but we have the shape functions that we know uh, how to de derive We've shown the properties of shape functions and we've demonstrated that they satisfy the partition unity, chronic or delta, and that can be used to approximate the solution over the domain. And remember xj, xk, all these are well known. You know the positions of the nodes for that element. Uh, and so therefore these are just simple polynomials, not, nothing complicated here. Uh, now notice how the u prime here requires that the derivatives be calculated um, and because the derivatives need to be calculated, we need to then uh, go ahead and do that. And you can see here, I've done it. The derivative is required. So derivative u tilde respect to x, and you can see how I 
took those derivatives here and, and put them in here nicely. And I'm gonna call this B bold. Uh, and we use this kind of approach because we need to use matrices in fine elements to really get the solution, uh, the solution fairly quick. So B bold and then the unknowns for that element are, if, if you recall, this was the element, has the unknowns here at this location, then unknown here at this location, and the unknown here at this location. So you have three unknowns for that element. And since it's quadratic, that's why you have the three unknown coefficients, which in this case are the unknown deflections at these three locations. You can see that that's what we've done here. So again, u tilde is m bold times b bold. The rate of u tilde respect to x is b bold times d bold. Very simple approach. And then we found that for the weak form lurking, what we do is we substitute for u here for the weak form and substitute the u tilde, the approximation function. And for v, I'll plug in n bold transpose. And that's exactly what I've done. u tilde, I plug in ni for v. u tilde for v, I plug in nk, the second shape function. And u tilde and for v, we plug in nj. And notice that we have three equations here. Uh, and we should have three unknowns, which is ui, uj, and uk. And when I look at this, uh, what I've done is for u prime, I plugged in b bold, d bold, which is exactly what you see here. And then this derivative here respect, respect to x. And then again, going back here, I have a minus p times v. And for v, I have uh, ni. So again, for v, you're plugging in ni. And then I repeat this for equation two and three and so forth. I already covered this in previous lectures. So this is recalling everything we learned. Now look how this column vector looks exactly like this row vector. So that row vector is B bold. Therefore, this column vector here is the same thing as B bold transpose. So I put it here, B bold transpose here, and then I have B bold here. And then this D bold goes outside of the integral. So I have this expression and this is equal to the integral. Now this column vector is like n bold transpose, very nice. And then I have pi zero and pj, which is this column vector. And note how for weak from Galerkin, we don't have to keep writing each of these equations. We can clearly see that for V, we plug in n bold transpose and we're done. So let's look at this example. I have a two element. Uh, I remember going through this in the previous lecture. I have a two element uh, problem. The first element has three nodes. The second element has three nodes. And the code numbers for the first element is zero, one, two. And the second element is two, three, four. And I'm applying a distributed load Q naught and an N load applied PL. Element one here is L. And element two is three L. So you can see that the nodes are not distributed properly, or not not they're not distributed properly, but they're distributed non-uniformly. Is what I meant. So if you look at element one, we already learned we already learned how to derive the shape functions for element number one. And for element number one, we found that these are the shape functions. And to find them fairly quick, I give you a few tricks. We know that this shape function a and i belongs to node i. And that shape function is zero at node k and at node j. You can see at node k, uh, uh, we have this length x to be x equals l over three. And you can see that three times l over three is l, l minus l is zero. So n i is zero at this node and this node. We learn that you can derive shape functions by simply using the idea of partition unity and very quickly derive the shape functions. For so for element one, these were the shape functions that were derived previously. For element two, these were the shape functions derived for this second element. Now notice that the shape functions had to be derived for each of these elements, and they look different from element one to element two. We had to calculate the stiffness matrix for element one, and notice how uh, once I do that, uh, I had to plug in the B bold matrix, which is the derivative of the shape functions with respect to X, and I'm able to find B bold. I can basically calculate B bold and find the stiffness matrix by integrating uh, B bold transpose dot B bold. And notice how the integral goes from X zero to XL. In essence, again, 
we're simply finding the stiffness matrix for element one, and we're really evaluating this right here, this uh, stiffness matrix from this equation, the weak von Galerkin. And then for element two, uh, and I apologize, but this is element one, this is the stiffness matrix, EA, you can see that there in Mathematica, and then B bold transpose is right here, times B bold is this one here, and then X zero to L is this integral limit. And then the B bold again is calculated here very simply Mathematica. For element two, a very similar situation, but now look how the, the integral goes, goes from X equals L to X equals four L. And also notice how the shape functions are different and notice how the derivatives of the shape functions are also different from this scenario here. This shape, these derivatives look different from these derivatives. You can see that uh, because the shape functions are different. And so for element number two, if you, if you recall from the example that I gave. And so, but I, I can still do it very easily mathematically. So integrate EA transpose B dot B, the integral goes from L to four L and I'm able to find the stiffness matrix for that element too. For, for what, are the, what are the issues that you're seeing with this approach? What are the issues that we see here with this approach? And before I go further, I want you to really think about it. Um, let's think about it. So if we notice with this 1D one, one finite element formulation with two elements, we, we, saw, we saw a few things here that are interesting. The first thing we saw was we saw in these two examples that the shape functions changed from element one to element two. We saw the integration limits also change. And we also saw how the derivatives of the shape functions are also different from element to element. They were not the same shape functions and their derivatives also changed. So the approach is not quite systematic. It cannot be deployed to a general problem because it's not systematic. I have to derive the shape, shape functions for each of those elements. I have to change the integration limits. I have to find those integrals using something like Mathematica and that's not really tractable. The derivatives of the shape functions keep changing from element to element. You saw that happening here. The integral for element two, the limits of them look different the shape functions themselves look different and the derivatives of the shape functions look different. For element one, you can see that that looks different from element two and the integrals also look quite different. Plus I have to use some sort of software to do it. So it's, it's not convenient, it's not systematic enough yet. Although it's getting us there, you can see that we've made progress. But what if I have a solution to the problem? What if I give you a solution that is actually quite insane. It's, it's, it's a mathematical miracle by itself. What if I told you that I can take any element in the domain that may look different from each other. Every single element looks different from each other, but I'm able to perform a transformation. And that transformation allows me to convert every element into the same domain. It's gonna look, every single element is gonna look the same. So I took this element that has this arbitrary shape with this local coordinate system S and T, and I'm able to turn that element into a square and that element goes minus one to one and minus one to one. What if I told you I can take a triangular element with curved surfaces with local coordinates S and T that when transformed, it transforms it into a right triangle. What if I told you I have a domain that goes from X1 to X2, an arbitrary domain where the middle node can be anywhere in between, but I'm able to transform it into an element that goes from minus one to one and the middle node is right in the middle. That interior node is right in the middle when you transform it. Won't that be a mathematical miracle? Because I can take a domain, an aircraft, or a launch vehicle, and I can discretize domain into non-uniform elements that don't look alike from element to element. And yet I can transform them into a master element that looks the same for every element. But if I'm able to solve the equations for this single element in this domain and then transform it back in the way it looked, then I made a lot of progress and that'll be very powerful 
and I'm able to then look for systematic ways to solving problems in finite elements. And that's very exciting to me. If I can map an arbitrary element shape to a standard element using isoparametric mapping, I can transform the coordinates from natural to physical coordinate systems. That would be amazing because every element will share the same shape functions, the same integration limits, the same derivatives of shape functions. And this will be awesome if every element looked the same. The approach will become even more systematic, more deployable, more powerful. And that's what I'm after. So let's check this out. I have this physical geometry as an example. I'm showing you an example of this. The strategy is as follows. I have this physical geometry that goes from xi to xj. I want to take the physical geometry and transform it between minus one to one. And I'm going to call this the natural geometry. Notice how here x depends on this variable c. So for example, xi, x, x at xi, sorry, x, at minus one, for example, here, x at minus one, which is this node, will give me xi. x at this value of c at one gives me, x at one gives me xj. So I'm able, to, if I'm able to come up with a formula that trans transforms from here to here or from here to here, that'll be great. So for linear elements, shape functions do not depend on the geometry. Here you can see that for me to achieve this transformation that you see here at the top, all I have to use is the very shape functions I used before for the linear element. And you can see it works out. Let's check it out. So if I say x of c equals xi times this shape function plus xj times this shape function, perhaps that's going to work out. Let's check. Of c at minus 1, I get 1 plus 1, 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1. If I apply C at minus one here, this goes away. So clearly X at minus one gives me XI, which is exactly what you see here. It gets mapped right here, okay? And you can see X at one gets mapped right XJ because if I, if I plug in one here, this goes away. And then I get two divided by two is one. So X at one is definitely XJ. I can write this in matrix format. N bold is the least, is the row vector of shape functions and the column X is the coordinate of the element. So notice how the shape functions is one minus C divided by two and NK one plus C divided by two. And this should be a J not K. But what is incredible, look how the shape functions are going to be the same. Doesn't matter what element you're talking about. It doesn't matter what element you're talking about this shape function will be the same from element to element. And the reason is because I'm taking every element and I'm going to map it into the standard master natural geometry element. You can see so far the transformation going from here to here and from here to here works out very beautifully. So now what I want to do is really solve the problem in this domain. I don't want to deal with this domain. If I can solve the problem in this domain, that'll be great. So I'll approximate the solution over this domain instead. That's more convenient to me. You can see here UI, and I'll use the shape function there, plus UJ times the shape function here. You can see here that C at minus one gives me one divided by one, and so I get UI, and that means that I'm looking at the deflection here. At C of, my, of one, this goes away, and I get one plus one, two, two divided by one, I get the deflection right at this node. So the deflection, which depends on the location where you are at. Um, we're going to try to solve this equation, uh, the Gorman equation, over this domain and not this one, if I can handle it. I'm going to put this again in a row vector in bold, and then ui and uj in a column vector of unknown coefficients. So notice how we're moving towards something more systematic. If I can move, I can create this transformation then I'm going to make significant progress because I'm able to now solve the differential equation in the same domain for every single one of those elements. And so now we have a way of going from the physical geometry to the natural geometry. And now we're trying to solve the governing equation over the natural geometry 
rather than physical geometry. But the cool thing about that, if I can turn every element into a natural geometry, all my calculations will be done here. And this should be, this should look the same because it's the same element size from minus one to one and everything looks, basically shape functions are the same. And all I have to do is this transformation, which is achieved by this coordinate transformation, which I'm calling isoparametric mapping. It's called isoparametric because the shape functions are the same for the coordinate transformation, but also for the deflection approximation. You can see here, I'm using the same shape functions. Here, the shape functions are allowing me to approximate the solution over this domain in a linear fashion, while the same shape functions are allowing me to transform going from the natural geometry to the physical geometry. And that's a very powerful idea. Again, you can check it yourself. If I had xi and xj here, like x equals four and xj was five, you put four here and five here, and you will see that this equation will definitely take it from here to here. And I invite you to do that. So we can use the coordinate transformation to interpolate between nodal positions. Uh, here you can see a quadratic element instead. So check this out. Here I have a middle node now, uh, an interior node, as you say. The interior node is right here. And notice how this interior node and this node and this node get transformed to minus one to one. And this interior node that was uh, here gets transformed to the middle. Now that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about transforming the physical geometry, the natural geometry in this manner. And that's allowing me to have a uniform distribution of nodes in between. Now I can derive these shape functions very easily. But these shape functions are very easy to develop using the partition unity and the uh, idea of uh, chronic or delta. So look at this node I, it, shape function I should be zero here and here. And you can see that this equation works out, but should be one at this node. And you can see minus one, uh, you get minus two, minus two times minus one is two, two divided by two is one. And you can see I get that as a one. And then I can do this for the middle node uh, and then for the node NJ. So these shape functions definitely work. Uh, and you can see that these shape functions multiplied by these coordinates are transforming the natural geometry to the physical geometry. You can see that's happening and that's very exciting. That's very exciting. I'm able to take a domain, uh, arbitrary domain and turn it into something that goes between minus one to one. And that's, that's fairly cool. But what I'm going to do now too, in this quadratic uh, element example, is I'm going to um, use a, the same interpolation functions. I'm gonna use them to look at um, the deflections. Right, so here I'm approximating the, the deflections using the same shape functions. And you can see here that I'm doing it in this domain, not this domain. I'm approximating a solution over this domain because that's more convenient to me. If I can solve every problem and the domain went from minus one to one, doesn't the solution basically look the same? Yes, that's why I wanna do that. And not only that, look how the shape functions should be the same from in, element to element, it doesn't matter. If the element has different ranges, uh, doesn't matter. Because I'm gonna put into minus one to one and that's all I care about. And the shape functions are gonna look the same. It doesn't matter what element you're looking at, the shape functions are the same. And when I look here, the deflections at C minus one gives me UI, which is exactly what I need. But that's really the deflection of this node. So this mapping here is mapping it from here to here. This is the equation that's transforming this natural geometry to the physical geometry, while this equation here is allowing me to solve the solution in the domain of interest, which is the more simple geometry that we're talking about, the natural geometry. I think it's really exciting that we have this element formulation that goes from xi to xj, say. And we know that b bold was this, right? So we already derived that. But what if I can make my, I can write everything so it's done in terms of uh, the C coordinate system. 
But here it goes, everything goes minus one to one. So I'm going to do a change of variables. I'm going to say, okay, I want to go from xi to xj, but I want to go from minus one to one. That's really what I want. And what does that do? We have to do a change of variable. Anywhere we see x, I have to make it into xc. B bold, inside B bold, we have this equation. Well, we need to have, i rather have it in terms of c. So I have to take this derivative um, somehow. Now the problem is, well, let's, let's finish this. So minus one to one, great, change everything to c. Sounds easy so far. Okay, I wanna do that transformation. Minus one to one, everything looks great. There's a problem, however, I need to take this derivative with respect to x. The problem is that ni and nj are a function of c and not x. So I have to do something about that. But other than that, don't all I have to do is a change in variables, which you've seen in calculus. That's all I have to do. And I'm there, but not quite. And the another thing I want to point out is look at how the integral turned into minus one to one. That's exciting as well to have a minus one to one integral because that means that I can come up with a numerical integration scheme that allows me to integrate it the same way for every element. So we substitute the x in terms of natural coordinates to do the transformation. But I'm not there yet. Uh, I had to do more work. And that work means I had to do more work. For the linear element, I have xc equals xi 1 minus c divided by 2 plus xj 1 plus c divided by 2. Notice that c at 1 uh, is the right node, so I get xj. Uh, c at minus 1. This goes to zero, I get the node on the left, which is xi. So this, this mapping is working. And the shape function we're using to approximate the solution over the domain is linear with n9 and nk being those basis functions we talked about. So to transform, I had to calculate this derivative somehow, dxc and dxc. Well, we had to do some chain rules. So dip c is d partial of x, which which to c, dip c. And I'm gonna call this little thing the Jacobian. Don't worry, just a word that people use. So Jacobian is this derivative. How do I find that derivative? Well, I know x in terms of c, so that should be easy. Derivative of x with respect to c, derivative of x with respect to c is the derivative of this with respect to c, which is very easy to find that derivative for. And so, okay, so I can do that fairly easily. Look at je, so je here is uh, xi partial of n i respect to c plus xj and j respect to c. So that's what I have here in the row vector and the column vector I have xi and xj. So this whole thing is j. There's no question about it, nothing very fancy here. And this b bold over bar, I'm gonna call it b bold over bar. And this column vector, I'm gonna call it x bold here which is a column vector of coordinates for that element. In this particular example, dxc is very easy to find. Why? So this is easy. The partial of x, which was c, is just basically, let's look at this derivative. This derivative here, respect to c is just minus one half. So this is minus one half. This derivative here is, respect to c is just one half. So minus one half and one half, multiply this by this column vector, I get xj minus xi divided by two. And isn't that just le over two, the element length, because xj and xi are the coordinates of the element and xj minus xi is the element length. So I get le over two. So now I know that this JE, this Jacobian, which is, so DX is Jacobian times dip C, this coefficient, 
that is basically le over two deep c and that's what i have here j is le over two and deep c has all this has been uh replaced by the by the, this dx so now i'm closer to my dreams of having everything in the deep c coordinate system then i have minus one to one p and both transpose and again i have this dx i have to take care of so again i use the chain differentiation partial x respect to c deep c in this case this is j and j is l over two and that's what i have there other than that it looks like i'm getting closer and closer to my dreams of having everything done in the natural coordinate system not the physical one and notice that here all the geometric information is contained in j that's the only thing that has a geometry information from the or original geometry remember we were we are going from the original geometry to a natural system where every element has the same size and same same limits for the domain uh, but the only thing that contains that geometry information is really j in this equation here you can see that okay so another challenge i have is i need to calculate somehow these b bolts but these b bolts are a function of i have to take the derivative of a and i respect to x the problem is that a and i and nj are both function of c directly not a function of x so somehow i have to figure this derivative out and that might not be as simple as it needs to be done But we can use the chain rule. Partial of ni respect to c, which is this here, is equal to partial of ni respect to x, partial x respect to c. Because that was x cancels out, and this derivative is this one. And I have to somehow figure out this derivative. I know this derivative. I don't know this one. I know this one. I have to calculate these things basically. But again, ni and nj are a function of c directly, not of x. Look, ni is this, nk is this. There's no x here. So you have to somehow find the derivative. So that's what we're trying to figure that out. So that's why we use chain rule. Partial ni respect to c equals partial ni respect to x, x respect to c. And you can see clearly here. I'm interested in this. This is easy to find. I know j. j is partial of x with respect to c. So I have to somehow so solve for this. I have to solve for this. And to do that, this is j. So bring that to the other side and get partial of a and i with respect to x equals partial of a and i with respect to c, j inverse. And I know j is l e over 2 for this problem. Uh, and j. Uh, which is the shape function that corresponds to node j. Again, partial of nj with respect to c equals partial of nj with respect to x. Partial of x with respect to c. x and x cancels out. So that works. Uh, this coefficient here is j or le over 2, but I'll call it j for now. And I have to solve for this because that's what I need here. And when I solve for this, uh, I get this is equal to this times j e inverse. So now I have a way of finding these derivatives. Sorry, finding these derivatives, which is the ones I need per this equation. So b bold equals, in essence, b bold equals this, right? This is, I already know what this is. This is this times that, j inverse. I'm going to factor j inverse out because that's also true for this and this. And j is the derivative of nj respect to x is this this is right here i just put it there and i put a j inverse so this is exactly uh i had this expression earlier i call it b bold over bar if you recall i had it here b bold over bar right there it shows up again here b bold over bar and that's j inverse which i know is le over two i already calculated that earlier so b bold over bar times j inverse j e inverse now i have a way of i know i know how to calculate uh these derivatives because i have them i know the expression for a and i 
and in general, the derivative of this respect to C is easy to calculate. These are easy. These derivatives are easy. J is known because I know the length of the element. So all this is known. And the cool thing, this is the same for every single element. J varies from element to element, but you can see the calculation for J is not that hard. So now I have a way. I have a way of converting everything to Cs. So let's see, uh, I'll show you. So for fee, B bold, for B bold, I have that B bold is B bold over bar J E inverse. I have to plug that in here, here, right? So we can do that directly. B bold transpose J E inverse, B bold transpose, not, not transpose, but over bar J E inverse. And then I have this J E from the differential element V X. If you remember, we had this as D X. So now I have J times dip C there too. Uh, now this is equal to minus one to one. Uh, this di differential uh, uh, upper DX became J deep C, if you, if you recall, that's the same. Uh, the hardest part was trying to figure out how to write those derivatives and we found a way. Um, now note how B bold over bar is easy to calculate. These are the same for every element. These derivatives are easy to find for every element. You just do it once for everybody. And so, uh, yeah, so uh, these are scalar quantities right here. So one of the G inverses goes away uh, and then you get a single J inverse deep C. And B bold over bar recall that is this much. And I know NI respect to C and I know NJ respect to C. I also know JE as LE over two. I showed you how to do that. So note in here that the shift functions go are the same for every element. Note that the derivatives of the shape function are for the same for every element. And also note that the integrals go from minus one to one, and that's the same thing for every element. The only thing that changes from element to element is this j, the length of the element divided by two. So Jacobian here, the Jacobian is the only thing that carries geometric information from element to element, and that's exciting. Let's step back, step back one more time and kind of walk you through what we talked about. I had to find the stiffness matrix and this integral limits will be the different. B bull has these derivatives of shape functions. They vary from element to element. I demonstrated that. Integration limits are different. The shape functions are different. That's not convenient for deploying a systematic way to solve problems. Instead, we're saying, okay, I don't care what shape element I have, I'll turn it to standard shape that's the same for every element. And perhaps I'll solve the governing equations in this domain. That's my preference. Let's do it in this domain. Great. What's the benefits? Every element has a shape function. Every element has the same integration limits. Every element, the derivatives of the shape functions will be the same. I showed you already that to transform the physical geometry to natural geometry, we can use the coordinates themselves with the shape functions I was using earlier for approximated solution, but I'll use them also to map it from physical geometry to natural geometry. And I showed you how that works out beautifully. And it works. At C minus one, I get two. Two divided by two is one. This is zero. You can see how I get xi. So when I plug in minus one, I get xi. When I plug in xj, c minus of one here, I get xj. So I am getting from here to here. It's working out. So I'm going to interpolate the displacements using the same shape functions. The very same shape functions, I'm going to use them to approximate the solution, but over this domain and not this domain. That's very advantageous to me because I, I, uh, that formulation will be the same for everybody. So that's what we claimed that we could do. Now the shape functions only de depend on C and they're the same for every element. And now uh, all I have to do is figure out, I also show you how it works for quadratic, it's the same idea. Um, and then I showed you how the finite element formulation for an elastic bar with linear element. Uh, I, I have this expression I showed you earlier and I had to convert that so it goes from minus one to one. And so I showed you how we can convert the differential element dx into dxpc. 
So if I can make the change in variable, then this goes minus one to one, just like in calculus. The only problem is that B bold has this derivative and that the deriv derivative is respect to X, but it, you know, you can see N I and N J don't depend on X, they depend on this C. So I had to do a trick for that. And also this DX is not straightforward. I have to calculate that too. So I showed you a trick to deal with the DX, chain rule DX, partial X respect to C, D, C. You, have, you don't have to even look at any of this. Just take the derivative of X respect to C here. You can see I get X I times one minus one half plus X J times one half. So I get X J minus X I divided by two and X J minus X I is the length of the element E L E. So I get L E here divided by two times deep C, which is um, what you see I got here. J is L E over two. But I wanted to show the whole process because um, there's some ideas that come into play that are useful for when I go to higher order problems, second dimensions, two dimensions, three dimensions. Uh, but beautifully done, you can also see I can do it more systematically. J is partial of X with respect to C. Um, I can do these derivatives here very easily. So partial of C respect to NI is this one here. Partial of C respect to NJ is this one here. That's what I have. And the coefficients are X, I, and X, J. You can see that there. The Jacobian is this much. You can see here that I can put this in a row vector. X, I, and X, J go to a column vector. And uh, I am ready because these are easy to calculate. These are easy. This minus one half is one half. You can see that there. So DX now can be turned into J deep C, changing variables. But now I'm stuck with this B bold. I still don't know how to deal with that. That's what I was trying to do here. I had to find the partial of NI respect to X, but NI does not depend on X, it depends on C. So I had to do a chain rule. Partial NI respect to C equals partial NI respect to X, partial X respect to C. X and X cancels out, so you get this on the left. That works out. I know partial X respect to C, which is LE over two or J um, or J. And I can now solve for NI respect to X, this partial. And this goes to the other side of the equation. You can see that I'm able to do that. Now I can do, do this. I know the partial of NI respect to C because NI is a function of C. Uh, I can do it for also for J um, easily. I know that J already is value of J. So this is very doable. I can calculate these components here of that row vector. Now I put this, uh, I plug for this, I plug in this whole thing. For this, I plug this whole thing, put it, put in this row vector and check it out. Check it out, J inverse uh, uh, factors out. And I'm gonna call this B bold over, over bar, just for simplicity. And I, it showed up earlier too, by the way. It showed up here as well. Um, beautifully done, J inverse right there, J is LE over two. Uh, but basically I have a way of converting this B bold into uh, something that can take derivatives off. Then uh, I showed you how to do that. Uh, for B bold, I put B bold transpose J inverse. For B bold, I put B bold tra uh, times J E inverse. Very easy. This J inverse cancel out with this J E. Done. Yeah, simple. Uh, so yeah, and now the, these derivatives are the same for everybody. These shift functions are the same for every element. The integral go from minus one to one. And this differential operator is the same for everybody. Beautiful and powerful. And the J is the only thing that carries the element information at length. So we can evaluate that very easily. The partial in I respect of C for a linear element is minus one half. The partial of NJ respect of C is one half. If you're wondering about that, right here, partial of NI respect of C is minus one half. Partial of NK respect to C is just, this should be J, I apologize, should be one half. So minus one half and one half. I know J is L over two, just plug it in. So I'm just plugging all these things in there. So uh, transpose of B bold is uh, over bar is minus one half, one half. Row vector there, minus one half, one half. J is two over L E deep C. The shape function is also in terms of C, so you can just write it out. This differential uh, element dx became L E over two deep C. Beautiful. And then just multiply all these out, integrate it. And when we're done, 
this is very cool. The stiffness matrix I got is EA over LE. One minus one minus one, one. That's the same thing we got with a regular element formulation. The very thing we got. We also see that this is this and this is that. So uh, nothing uh, too fancy. Everything, well, it is fancy and it is cool, but nothing too complicated, not to be worried about. Let's revisit the same problem, but not using isoparametric isopar isopar elements. Uh, so this is what I had, um, the same problem, but I'm gonna look at how to do this more in a systematic way. So let's look. I want, I have, this is the formulation I have for the single element, but it's a quadratic, I'm using quadratic elements now. Sure, it's not gonna be very different. Point being here is I wanna convert into minus one to one and anything that's dx, I wanna put into xc. That's really what I want. A change of variables, like just in calculus. But I do have to carry, calculate that derivative. And now my shape functions are a function of, of, of c directly. And I have to find this derivative, so I have to do some tricks there. But it's the same thing as before. So the first step is to calculate uh, the how to transform the element so that it goes from a an element with the interior node to an element that goes from minus one to one with the middle node at x equals zero. You can see that this works very beautifully. At c minus one, you get this one and zero here. At c equals zero, this is zero, and this is zero, you get the middle node as one, xk. And at x equals xj, you have c equals one, and you can see it works out because this is zero, that's zero, and you get one here as a coefficient. Xc is at c is one is xj. So it maps the element that has a end coordinates xi and xj with the interior node xk maps into an element that goes minus one to one with a middle node at x equal at c equals zero. So this works out. I'm going to put this into shape functions a and i and k and j. Put that in the row vector times the column of coordinates x i x k and x j. So then I'll calculate dx. Uh, I already showed you how to do that. Dx c, uh, dx c uh, is partial of x respect to c, dip c, and this is j. I'm calling that j. It's a convention in industry. Uh, j here is x i respect to, and then all these multiplications. So all I'm doing there is taking these derivatives here, partial x respect of c. Um, and that's just taking that derivative there, this derivative here. Uh, so that's that. Uh, and I called a b bold uh, over bar to be these components, uh, partial of ni respect of c, partial nj respect of c, and partial of nk respect of c. And the column vector has x, i, x, j, and x, k. I've taken dxc and I put there j dip c. Beautiful, I know how to calculate j. Xi and xj and xk are known. You know where the element resides. You know where the middle node is or the interior node is. So you know these values. That's not hard, I know these values. That's not hard. But now I do have to deal with these partial derivatives. Uh, because I have this B bold that's made up of ni respect to x, nj respect to x, and nk respect to x. I can just do one of them because the rest of them are the same. Partial ni respect to c, I don't have to calculate that, but I have to do a chain rule. ni respect to x, partial x respect to c. And I don't know this, and that's what I need in this matrix, in this B bold, which is going to be in the matrix multiplication you see above. So I know this is J, invert it, and then solve it for ni respect to x, like that. I know this partial, because ni respect to c is known. I know this uh, ni c is just this, so I know how to calculate that derivative. 
And the same for NG and NK and so forth. So these are the same. I can put now, um, I can substitute um, for B bold, I can substitute this equation here into there uh, because I found a way of writing this expression in terms of uh, C. Uh, so you can see I've done it. Uh, J inverse uh, factors out. Remember that J inverse is coming from here. Each of them have that. When I plug this in here, plug this in here, plug this in here, it has a common J inverse that factors out. That's what you see there. And then this whole thing I had told you earlier, I'm calling B bold over bar. And that came from here. Now I can plug this into this equation above and I get B bold transpose J inverse like that. And look at my integrals minus one to one. And one of these J inverse cancels out and you get this. So now I'm ready to apply the idea. Observation is looking at this. The integral on any element in the global coordinate system is now an integral from minus one to one. Beautiful. The shape function and derivative of this uh, stuff is the same for all the elements. And the Jacobian is a function of C. That's the only thing. And it enters the integral and depends on the nodal coordinates of the element. That's the only thing that has geometry information. So um, I can continue the example now and I can let Mathematica do the work. We can define the shape function and the, the, the derivatives. And notice how that shape function is the same for every element. I don't, earlier, in the earlier example I had done, I had to derive shape functions, but I had to derive specific shape function for every element. Now I have to derive shape function just once for an element that goes minus one to one with the interior node in the middle at C equals zero. I'm using P here for simplicity. So yeah, I can just do that. Uh, I also have to take that derivative with respect to P or C. Uh, that calculation that I'm talking about is this one right here. I'm taking these derivatives. And I'm letting um, Mathematica do their work for me. I don't have to repeat this step anymore. I do it just once. Uh, and that step can be stored in a software, like Abacus, for example, has a bunch of shape functions. They define that way ahead of time and it's saved in the backbone, in, in, the, in the background for use later for any other element. Uh, for element one, the uh, coordinates are 0, 1 third L, L. For element two, the coordinates are L, 3 L, 4 L. So I'm looking at the problem statement here, just to remind you uh, that I know there's coordinates here for element one and two. So that's what I'm doing here, just calculating the coordinates, L, 3 L, 4 L. And I calculate J, the Jacobian for element one and Jacobian for element two, which is B bar dot the uh, nodal coordinates. And then I have B bar dot the nodal coordinates for element number two. And I should get a single value, which makes sense. That's what I got. This right here, we showed it earlier. The Jacobian's B bold over bar, X bold. And I'm going to be honest, uh, you're going to learn the most if you re-derive the equations yourself at, at an appropriate pace. And just looking at the video lecture or live lecture is not sufficient. You're going to have to derive the equations to fully understand the extent of what we're doing. So we know the Jacobian for each of these elements. The shape functions are known for every element. They're the same. B bar is the same for every element. It's the derivative of this shape function with respect to C. In this case, I'm using P for simplicity in Mathematica. Done. This Jacobian though is different. You can see from element one to element two. That's the only thing that has element information. And now just simply, I calculated the element stiffness matrix using Mathematica. EA, you can, I guess uh, EA is right here as a coefficient. Um, 
And then I have B bold transpose, which is right there. B bold uh, over bar, which is right there. J inverse, right there. Divided by J one, basically. And then, uh, yeah, and the integral goes from minus one to one. So I calculated uh, the whole thing here. You can see that. That's a stiffness matrix for element one and the stiffness matrix for element two at the bottom. Yeah. We only have a force vector for element two, since there's no distributed load that we applied to element one, if you recall. So all you have to do is integrate this stuff over element two. We then apply the boundary conditions concentrate loads and proceed to solve and assemble the system of equations. Let's look at an example. Consider the following problem, ODE problem. Looks like this. And these are the boundary conditions. The exact solution looks quite complicated. Have these basal functions. And the plot, you know, the plot is not trivial. I'm plotting between x equals one to two. How do we do this problem using the isoparametric formulation? I start with the ODE, multiply by the weight function V, Integrate over the domain. And this is the way I integrate over parts. You can use a book to do your way. And when I do that, I get these boundary conditions. And purposefully, I've given values here on purpose. 3x u prime is q k. And 3x u prime here QI. So it's just, it's just for simplicity. But if you plug it in here, you will see this, I get the same thing. And the idea is to have the same minus sign like that. So it's systematic. I'm finding systematic ways of doing the problem. But you can see when I plug it in here, I get the same thing as above. So I'm not changing the problem at all. It's, it's the same problem. Nothing to be afraid of. So I'm formulating the weak form. When I get to this point, that's the weak form. I'm done. That's part one. Part two, the weak for the problem, the weak form of the problem is this. Okay, so what is the second a, a thing we need to do? We need to plug in an approximation function, and I'm going to substitute a quadratic element formulation. So uh, I'm going to select an, a quadratic approximation that uses shape functions instead with unknown coefficients that correspond to the nodes. Remember, in the weak form Galerkin, the unknown coefficients had no physical meaning. But now we're turning this problem into a way such that the unknown coefficients are the nodal unknowns. And so things do make more sense. So U tilde is the approximation over that domain that goes from Xi to Xk is basically this row of shape functions times this column vector of Ui, Uj, Uk. This row vector is in bold. This column vector is D bold. I have to find this derivative. And that derivative is a and i respect to x. I have to find that because I see it here, u prime. I'm forced to find that derivative. Uh, b bold, d bold. And I'm calling this whole thing b bold here. And for v, anywhere I see v, I'm gonna put m bold transpose. That's the whole idea of what we've been discussing. So uh, for v, I can put um, b bold transpose because For V, I have to put M bold transpose and the derivative of M bold uh, prime is B bold. You can see that here. So I have B bold transpose. For you, I have B bold times D bold. For you, I have N bold times D bold. For V, I have N bold transpose. For V, I have M bold transpose. So I have 10 there, sure. And then this can be written in a column vector. 
And I already covered how you can go from here to here. Fairly straightforward. A question, a question that could come up is how I went from here to here and from here to here. Very easy. For V, I'm plugging in inbold uh, transpose. But inbold, the only thing that's going to remain here is one. Because the shape function corresponding to this node, if I at x equals xi, is one. This is a current or delta property. And the shape function that goes here is nk and is one at this node, but zero in this node. So that's why you just get qi and qk. And I encourage you to check it out at home to make sure you get the same thing I got. But I already know that qi is this and qk is that. I, I just did that for, for simpleness. Uh, you see, I had it right here. I just wrote it in terms of Q just for fun. But that is my element formulation. That is my element formulation. There's nothing more to it. We can now derive the isoparametric formulation for this element. I'm using a quadratic approach. So my quadratic um, uh, mapping is needed. Uh, I'm going to map it using this uh, mapping function that takes it for, from the element coordinate system to the natural coordinate system. You can see here that I'm using quadratic uh, shape functions and they add up to one. They satisfy the Kronecker delta property where this is one here, but zero here and here. This is one here, but zero here and here. This is one here, but zero here and here. So there you go. I also show you how DXC is, is this chain rule here, dash J, J dip C, and J is just the derivative of uh, x with respect to c, which is the derivative of x with respect to c. So you just do that der derivative and put in this bro vector and uh, of b bold, and the column vector becomes x i x j x k. I also want to turn this integral to go from minus one to one. So I have to plug in for dx j dip c, which comes from here. And yeah, so that's what I want to do. Uh, but now I have to deal with this uh, thing here. So notice how I have an X here. That X is in bold X bold, which is a very different problem than I've shown before, but I want to show you that that shows up. And that's an interesting fact. We showed several times now how B bold is b bold over bar divided by one over g j e or multiplied by one over j e. So I get this one, this one. So I have two of them squared. That's that. This j dip c. Very straightforward. I can go now to Mathematica. I can evaluate the Jacobians. Calculate b, bar, b bold bar over bar. I know the element coordinates for this particular element. Um, remember, the, the shape functions are the same for every element. It doesn't matter what you do. For element one, I decided to break it up like that just to show you how it works. I put the interior node in the middle just to keep it simple. You can see j1 came out to be 1.125. The Jacobian and the Jacobian for element two came out to be 0.375. So nothing very fancy right now. Element one has nodes one, two, three, and element two has three, four, five. Now I can calculate the element stiff stiffness matrix and force vectors for element one. I have to calculate this for element one also. So let's see. So you can see I'm calculating here M1 and M2. This multiplication is this one right here. Just this here. 
this time I'm doing it for two elements. K1 has that multiplication times transpose B bold transpose there times B over bar there over J1 squared there. You can see everything looks the same as this equation. It doesn't like mathematics, it's visually appealing. And the integral, look at that, goes from minus one to one. So that's for element one. And then Q is the integral of this calculation here, which is right here, that integral there. You can see I have a minus 10 there. Everything's matching in transpose. J is known, but uh, we can put it there. And then from minus one to one. So everything looks the same as that. So I'm able to calculate that, that force vector. And then I have these concentrated forces. Uh, so, so this came out to be that. And that had to do with this right-hand side here. I haven't shown you what to do with that yet. For element two, the same thing. Uh, I have this multiplication, which I already did earlier for element two. Everything else is straightforward. B bolt over bar is the same for every element. So I define it once, I'm done. Shear functions are the same for every element. J2 changes. The Jacobian is different for every element and it contains the geometric information of the element. So I can calculate K2. The integral goes from minus one to one. That's K. And this integral from minus one to one, 10 times this stuff, you can now get that too. So now I have the that one that goes here, and I still have to deal with this. So let's assemble the whole thing. We know how to assemble element one and two because that's easy. We can assemble the distributive forces easily. I have to assemble it. I have one, two, three, three, four, five. I'm using two elements, and each element has nodal uh, code, uh, code numbers of one, two, three. The second element is three, four, five, where node three is shared. I have to assemble uh, Q now. So let's assemble Q now. So Q um, for row one is only that one. So minus, four, four, minus 0. 0.4167 is that one. And this needs to be evaluated. Let's look at what's going on here. So add node one, xi is one. So that's one. So let's look back. The domain goes from one to two. And I divide the domain into two elements. Element one, xi is one. And notice how at node one, u prime at one is one. So I know that. I'm going to put in the boundary condition in there directly. Yeah, so you see here, three times one times one is three. At node two, I was not specifying any anything. Uh, and you can see here, when I assemble everything, I get minus 1.667 for row two, but nothing there, zero there. That's an interior node. At node three, I have minus 0.4167, which is this one here. And, but that has to be added to row three from element two. So minus 1.25. And then you have to put this in here. But I'm not applying any forces or I'm not specifying any slope at that particular boundary. So this is zero. And then the next one is zero two there and minus five there. Nothing gets assembled against this. And finally, for row five, I minus 1.25 there. And then here, um, I'm specifying the deflection there, I believe. So U at two is known as one. So we don't know. We don't know this. We had to find it. So I'm ready to assemble everything. And when I assemble the stiffness matrix, uh, I get this column vector. I get the stiffness matrix and I get this column vector here. So I know I can 
now solve for u1, u2, u3, u4, and then and, and be able to answer the problem. So the solution when I do it in Mathematica shows that the exact solution is very close to the finite element solution uh, using quadratic approximation. Remember the exact solution had Bessel function, very complicated solution, uh, but the percentage error is very small. Um, now the integration that I did here from minus one to one, that was done in Mathematica. And these integrals are probably done as exactly as you can, but that's not going to be systematic enough. I still need to do something more. I still need to find a more systematic way. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting closer. And that's the good news. Uh, I just need to figure out how to integrate now and not rely on Mathematica. There must be a quicker way to integrate uh, these expressions. 